It's a real pleasure to be here tonight to talk to the Arizona Geological Society because I can assume that either you are a geoscientist, you love a geoscientist, or you love geoscience, or maybe all of the above. I love geoscientists because they observe and measure reality. They are well grounded. The closest thing to ground truth in science is a reliable observation of nature. Now I'm a geophysicist, which means I had to suffer through a lot of courses in mathematics and physics in addition to mineralogy and optical petrology. But I'm different from most geophysicists. Most geophysicists came to geophysics through mathematics and physics. They think in terms of equations. Many actually believe their equations are reality. I came to geophysics as a field geoscientist. I think in terms of observations. Equations can be very useful, but any equation is only as good as the assumptions used to write that particular equation. I want to understand what the assumptions are, how well founded each assumption is, and whether these are the best equations to describe what is actually physically happening. In science, we observe an event. There are usually several possible explanations for what caused that event. We need to determine which explanation, which series of equations, best describes what is actually physically happening. Now, 11 years ago, I discovered an enigma in climate science, something that just did not make sense. As I looked into the details, I realized that solving this enigma could be extremely important. Being retired and having already rode my own raft twice through the Grand Canyon, I decided to put aside almost everything else in my life, except for my wife, to focus full time on science to track down the reliable observations and the reliable assumptions related to climate change. Being self-funded, my only obligation was to myself to do the very best science I could. I followed my instincts wherever they led and tried to minimize distractions. In 11 years, I've worked through more than 10,000 papers and shelves of books. It was very hard work, but very stimulating. I really enjoyed putting all the pieces together, and it seems to have paid off. So what I want to discuss tonight is how this lonely quest by a lowly geophysicist has led to three game-changing conclusions in geology, in climate science, and in physics, all well-grounded in clear geoscience observations. Two of these conclusions, based on observations from geoscience, completely throw out the traditional equations used widely throughout physics and throughout climate science. So it was Isaac Asimov who said, scientific discovery does not start with someone running down the hall shouting, Eureka! Rather, advances go more like someone saying to himself, hmm, that's odd. What I'm going to talk about tonight is three different issues with when I came across them, I said, hmm, that's odd. The first conclusion I'm going to talk about is that volcanoes rule climate change. Two fundamentally different kinds of volcanoes, volcanic eruptions cause warming or cause cooling, and the balance of these volcanoes is determined by plate tectonics. And from this standpoint, you can explain climate change throughout all of geologic time very clearly. Secondly, where's the heat? Greenhouse gases simply do not absorb enough heat to cause global warming. What is heat? Heat is what a body must absorb to get warmer, and heat is what a body loses by radiation or conduction to get colder. And I'll explain what heat is later on in more detail. And the third point is that heat flows by resonance. Heat is, in fact, a very broad continuum of frequencies. And at each frequency, the way the energy flows is that a molecule on one body is resonating with a molecule on the other. And I'll explain this in more detail. So these three conclusions redefine the climate wars in important ways, providing an opportunity 
with a little humility on all sides for all of us to work together to the benefit of humanity. One of the hardest things for scientists to do now is to admit that there is a problem with greenhouse gases. Most scientists I talk to just simply cannot conceive of the slight possibility there could be anything wrong with greenhouse gas theory. So that's part of the humility I'm talking about. And on the skeptic side, there are some things to be a little humble over too. But I think if we can all move forward positively, we can improve the situation significantly. Now also in the background of what I'm gonna talk about today has been my curiosity for years, and I suspect many of you have had this curiosity too. What in the world makes these sudden changes that we put on the geologic time scale over periods, epochs, and ages. I mean, there's sediments forming for millions of years in the same environment. And then in a blink of a micro inch, there's another layer on top, which is a totally different environment, totally different fossils. What is it that punctuates the geologic time scale that we can have these changes? And what I want to put in the back of your mind right now is that something that plays a major role are large igneous provinces. These are large provinces of basalt flows that can cover areas of hundreds of square kilometers and even millions of square kilometers. And it's these provinces that cause the sudden warming that we see so often throughout geologic time. Now to the enigma. It was 11 years ago, I was on the internet doing something totally different and I came across data from the GISP-2 borehole in Summit, Greenland showing that the temperature when we warmed out of the last ice age, the green line here, was also a time when there was the highest volcanic activity recorded in the same ice, the red line here. So we're looking from 25,000 years to present. The last glacial maximum was sometime back around 24, whatever, plus or minus. And what we see is that there was a warming up into the bowling warming, but that didn't last long enough to warm the ocean. And so we went back down into the Younger Dryas, but then starting at 12,000 years ago, there was not only major volcanism, much more than recorded in any other Greenland ice, but it lasted for 2,500 years. To go in and out of ice ages, you have to cool and warm the ocean. And the ocean is the major heat content of the ocean atmosphere system. It takes time to warm the ocean. And from this, we would say it takes a couple of thousand years of constant volcanism to warm the ocean. So when I looked at this, I said, hmm, that's odd. All volcanologists and all climatologists know that big explosive volcanic eruptions cause cooling of about a half a degree centigrade for two to four years, depending on the size. Every major explosive volcano that we have seen throughout written history caused cooling. And I said, how in the world can volcanoes cause cooling and warming? Now, when we look in Iceland at the same time, there are a number of table mountains or tuya being formed. This on the upper left is a table mountain. And this is what happens when a basalt flow flows under ice sheet. It can't go horizontally. It gets cooled very quickly. Instead, it, it flows vertically and you build these big broad-shouldered mountains until the basalt comes out on the top of the ice sheet and then the rocks can flow out over the ice. And when you look at the systems of these that exist, it turns out that 12 of the 13 best dated tuyas or table mountains in Iceland were active during the bowling warming and the warming out of the last ice age. These were major volcanic systems. There was, uh, we can talk about the volume of basalt that came out these were significant basaltic eruptions that were going on at the time that we see the, the sulfur dioxide or the sulfate sediments in the ice cores. And it makes a reasonable conclusion that it may have been basaltic volcanism that was involved. Now, basaltic volcanism comes in many different forms. Most of you are familiar with Hawaii, where it kind of oozes out over time. But there was an eruption in Iceland in 2014 from the volcano Bartabunga. Now, you probably didn't hear about it because it didn't interrupt airspace. The lava just flowed out over the ground. And in six months, it covered an area of 33 square miles, 85 square kilometers, the size of the island of Manhattan. It took more than 30 years for Hawaii to get that kind of basalt out of the ground. In six months, 
This was the largest basaltic eruption of this type since 1783. So what's important with these eruptions is that they're aerial extensive, they're flood basalts, and they can flow over a large area, and I'll be talking about the areas. They typically occur in rift zones, such as Iceland, such as the East African Rift, and it turns out such as the Snake River Plain. One of the things that volcanoes do, both basaltic and explosive volcanoes, is they deplete the ozone layer. The black line in this lower diagram shows the annual mean total column ozone measured per year in Orosa, Switzerland. So this is measured in mid-latitudes. And what you see is ozone's up and down, but on average it stayed pretty constant from 1927 when these records started until uh, about 1970. And then there was a slow depletion of the ozone, but the biggest changes in ozone were after the eruption of Mount Pinatubo in 1991, and after the eruption of A.F. Fiatli in 2010, and Grimsvatten in 2011. Now, Pinatubo was the largest volcanic eruption since 1912, so it's the largest volcanic eruption on this diagram. But A.F. Fiatli was 100 times smaller. But notice the ozone is depleted, and so it depleted significantly. So what's important with these basaltic lava flows is the amount of global warming is determined by the duration and the aerial extent. And the duration can be six months, as in Barthabunga's case. In the case of really large fields of millions of square kilometers, it can be hundreds of thousands of years. The other kind of volcanism we have is aerosol forming explosive volcanism. And this is Mount Pinatubo in 1991. These occur primarily above subduction zones as opposed to rift zones. They form aerosols where they explode megatons of sulfur dioxide and megatons of water vapor up into the lower stratosphere where it forms sulfuric acid aerosols. And the crystal size of or the drop size in these aerosols get large enough to reflect and scatter sunlight. So what's observed with the explosive volcanoes is you do get a little ozone depletion the first year, but then there's a net global cooling. Now this diagram on the lower right shows modeling of the ocean temperature following Krakatoa in 1883, assuming the ocean surface worldwide cooled about a half a degree for a few years. And what you notice is that you can still see the effects on ocean temperature 100 years later. What this means is that you can accumulate those effects. And when you have four or five major explosive eruptions per century, and that continues for even millennia and tens of thousands of years, you can increment the ocean cooler and cooler down into an ice age. So what's important with explosive volcanoes is the amount of global cooling is determined by the number of eruptions per century of the really big eruptions. Now humans also, it turns out, have caused global warming. This shows from 1945 to 2015. In the 60s, chlorofluorocarbons became very, very popular. They're very stable, inert substances that could be used for refrigerants, for spray can propellants, for solvents. And they were widely used in the, by the late 60s. I think many of you can remember in 1970s, early 70s, you could buy almost anything in the spray can. And it was in 1974 that Molina and Rowland discovered that these CFCs, when they reach high in the stratosphere, can be broken down by ultraviolet light and through chemical process release chlorine and then one atom of chlorine can destroy 100,000 molecules of ozone. So when the CFC started going up, you notice that a few years later ozone depletion goes up. That few years is what it takes for the CFCs to get up into the atmosphere. And as ocean ozone depletion increased, the temperatures also increased. The Antarctic ozone hole was discovered in 1985, and scientists said, oh gosh, we got a bigger problem here than we thought. This is much bigger depletion than we had imagined. And in two short years, scientists and political leaders at the United Nations passed the Montreal Protocol. There was a great deal of argument over the protocol, but it went through relatively easily because it was not overly expensive to deal with. This Montreal Protocol took effect in January 1989, and sure enough, by 1993, the increase in CFCs had stopped. 
the Montreal Protocol mandated the cutback in production of CFCs. So the increase of chlorine from CFCs in the troposphere stopped increasing. In 1995, ozone depletion stopped increasing. In 1998, temperatures stopped increasing. And temperatures were pretty constant from 1998 to 2013 in something known as the global warming hiatus. It's also been argued about a great deal, but all of the major analyses of global temperatures show there was not a really significant increase in temperature or decrease from 1998 to 2013. Then in 2014, with the eruption of Barthabunga, temperatures started increasing at five times the rate they were increasing from 1970 to 1998. So increasing CFCs caused increasing warming from 1970 to 1998. The Montreal Protocol stopped the increases. I argue the world would be at least a half a degree warmer now had we not had the Montreal Protocol. But ozone has remained depleted, and that means we're going to continue to melt ice, we're going to continue to warm the ocean, and CFCs last forever. So it was expected it would be many, several decades before we could return to the ozone levels of 1970 and before, uh, but it's not even recovering at that rate at this point. It's a problem that we face and we need to work on. So these effects of ozone depletion and aerosols can be summarized in a few schematics here. Under normal conditions, ultraviolet C warms the stratosphere. It actually has enough energy to blow oxygen apart, and so that causes warming. And then ultraviolet B has enough energy to blow ozone apart, and most of that is absorbed in the ozone layer. Ultraviolet A and visible light reaches Earth and keeps us warm. When you deplete the ozone layer from a volcano ejecting chlorine and bromine up into the stratosphere, then more ultraviolet B than normal reaches Earth. The ozone layer is observed to get cooler because it's not absorbing so much ultraviolet B, and Earth is observed to get warmer. We measure the ultraviolet B uh, on Earth in relationship to the cooling of the stratosphere and the ozone layer and the warming of Earth. When you have an explosive volcano, it forms these aerosols that end up reflecting sunlight. And so while, for example, following Pinatubo, there was major warming of almost 3 degrees centigrade in northern industrial areas that next winter, December, January, following the eruption, the net effect long term is cooling. And CFCs do much the same in depleting the ozone layer and increasing the amount of ultraviolet B reaching Earth. Now, what I've just been talking about is there have been big changes in the temperature trends since 1945. The four wiggly lines here are the annual mean global temperatures determined by the four major groups that do these calculations, NOAA, Goddard Institute of Space Studies, uh, Berkeley Earth, and the Hadley Center in England. And they all show pretty much the same thing. There was very little change in temperature from 1945, or at least 1946, to 1970. There was a significant increase in temperature to 1998. There was very little change in temperature from 1998 to 2013. And in 2014, we began to have major increase in temperature again. Meanwhile, carbon dioxide, the dashed line, was just increasing the whole time. There is no explanation that I know of from carbon dioxide from greenhouse gases that can explain these changes in trend in 1970, 1998, 2014. I just explained them to you in some detail in the last five minutes. Now I'd like to move back to a much bigger picture looking at the last 60 million years. And the green line here is the one we've been seeing before. It's the uh, proxy for ocean temperature based on oxygen isotopes of, uh, uh, measured in, in various ways. And you can see there was a general decrease in temperature from 60 million years ago to the present, or at least down to the bottom of the Ice Age. The black line is the amount of ocean crust production, the rates of spreading in the ocean crust, and it increases downwards. The red line is the cumulative number of eruptions that have been known. I tabulated these some years ago in a publication. It's the cumulative number of eruptions that uh, have been known increasing downward. And what we can see is that as the number of eruptions started increasing, the world cooled down into the onset of Antarctic glaciation. 
These eruptions, uh, there was a great deal of subduction going on at these times under arcs all around the world, uh, all around the Pacific, especially that we're seeing now. Then with the Himalayan mountain building from 23 to 16 million years ago, there was not that many eruptions. The ocean floor uh, was, didn't change a lot, and we had the mid-Miocene climate optimum. But then more recent major plate subduction around the Pacific led to the cooling, I argue, uh, into the last ice age, the last few million years of cooling, and into the ice age where we are today. So here's an example of where the number of subduction volcanoes that are active seems to have a major effect on long-term climate change. This is a much shorter period of time, the last 125,000 years, the time since the Eemian climatic optimum, which is the next to last time before we warmed out of the ice age. And the vertical black lines are known volcanic eruptions, same as I had in the red line in the earlier graph. The green line is, is oxygen isotopes. But these are oxygen isotopes from deep sea records. That means this is the temperature at the bottom of the ocean. It takes a lot of time to warm the bottom of the ocean. So this is integrated out over, over thousands of years. Furthermore, this particular study took 57 of the best of deep sea records of oxygen isotopes and averaged them all together, which is another way of smoothing out the data. But what you see is a gradual decrease from the last climatic optimum down into cooler and cooler and cooler times down to the glacial maximum, and suddenly we warmed up. Now, if we look at ice core oxygen isotopes, where we can see air temperature, and we have resolutions of each sample is just, just years apart, so we, can, we have good resolution, we get a much more complex picture. Here's the same data, or the same period of time, and 25 times since the 120,000 years ago, the Earth warmed suddenly within years to a decade or so, and then cooled very slowly over centuries uh, to millennia. These 25 times are known as the Dansgaard Esker events. They've been studied in Greenland for a couple of decades now. They're well established. We see them in all the ice cores there. 25 times there was sudden warming, slow cooling. The average sequence was about 3,000 years long. But these are clearly not cycles. It's not cyclic. They're highly erratic. The time of onset and the time of duration is changing in every case. This is the same data from the previous slide showing there is a basic correlation between what we saw by integrating ocean temperatures, but what's actually happening at the surface is something much more complicated. So the footprints of climate change seen very clearly in the Greenland ice core records is sudden warming, slow cooling, and erratic sequences that average about 3,000 years long. This means climate was changing from ice age conditions to almost non-ice age conditions every 3,000 years. I don't think any of us ever stopped to think that climate would change that fast. This is over the last 10,000 years, the Holocene. The green line, again, is oxygen isotopes from the Greenland ice sheet, uh, given the temperature. And what you notice is every 1,000 years or so, there is a major peak in the temperature. I talked about Barthabunga, a recent eruption covering 85 square kilometers. The eruption of Elgia, the largest eruption in Iceland since Iceland was formed, was uh, founded, people moved there, extruded 800 square kilometers of lava. And this seems to be one of the major reasons for the medieval warm period. And notice the medieval warm period is fairly spiky. It's not something that went on for a long period of time. Similarly, about 2,000 years ago to 2,200 years ago was the time of the last major eruption of basalts on the Snake River Plain around the uh, Craters of the Moon National Monument. That lat flow that was active at that time covered 700 square kilometers, and this happens to be the same time as the Roman Warm Period, the time when it got so warm that Hannibal drove his elephants over the Alps and surprised Rome from the north. We can see that there are many other times where there are well-known major basaltic lava flows occurring at the same time as the major temperature. There's a lot of work to be done to flesh this out, to look for all the studies, to look for all the different flows. But all of the major flows of basalt that we know of during these times are clearly associated in time with sudden major warming. Now, we find evidence of this rapid cycling many other places. This is some data from the uh, Eocene Green River Formation in Wyoming, in southwestern Wyoming. 
And Rod Sertam, when he studied all this, pointed out that there are layers of oil shale on top of Trona, on top of Dolostone, on top of oil shale, on top of Trona, on top of Dolostone. He argued that the oil shale was being formed in an environment like you see today in Mud Lake, Florida. He argued that the Trona was being formed in an environment like you see today at Lake Magadi in Kenya. And you can see the Trona out there on top of the water. And he argued by putting all the data together that on average, one of these cycles lasted about 5,000 years. So this is a case from throughout the geologic record where we don't have the same kind of dating we have in the ice cores, but it shows rapid change going on all the time. Now this is a graph I think you all can understand immediately. <laughs> We're looking here from 500 million years ago, since the Cambrian time up to 200 million years ago. And what I want you simply to notice is the number of white dots. The shaded area there goes from 10 degrees centigrade to over 30 degrees centigrade. These dots are the oxygen isotopes determined from the brachiopod shells. So the time this critter was living, this was the temperature of the environment he lived in. And what you see is every brachiopod that was analyzed gave a different temperature. The changes were going on extremely rapidly. And without oxygen isotopes, we wouldn't have a prayer of unraveling this. You know the problems of dating as we get back in the older and older time. But here, it's very clear. There were sudden changes going on. And again, we're talking a spread of over 20 degrees centigrade. There were longer period changes shown with the blue line, the ice ages. But still, the background noise was every few thousand years, there appears or there could have easily been changes going on here. We can't quite resolve it. Now, if we look at some of the big large igneous provinces, the three biggest, which also correlate with the three major mass extinctions in, that we know on the geologic record, are the Siberian basalts covering an area of over 7 million square kilometers in Siberia. Now, that's 87% of the United States. That's lava covering every state in the United States except Montana and Texas. Just imagine basaltic lava from New York City to San Francisco to Miami to Seattle. That's the kind of th event we're talking about. And if we were living back then, we wouldn't be living now. This was a time when the ocean actually got as hot as a hot tub, 104 degrees Fahrenheit. There was 96% extinction of marine species. There was 70% extinction of terrestrial vertebrates. The ocean got highly acidic. Temperatures got very high. And there's some evidence from leaves and other things that ozone was depleted, causing mutations at that time. Although the evidence of ozone depletion back there is, is pretty slim. But from comparing more recent times, I think we can assume that that's what was going on with the warming. The Central Atlantic Magmatic Province is another example covering 11 million square kilometers. This is when North America and Africa started moving apart. What I didn't say about the Siberian basalts was they were trying to rift Siberia apart, and it failed. But a whole lot of basalts came out in the attempt. So the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province, again, shows the basalts as they began to be rifted apart. The uh, Deccan basalts in India, 66 million years ago, only covered an area of a half a million square kilometers. But they also led to the third largest mass extinction. Meteors clearly played a role but these lavas were pouring out for 20,000, 30,000 years. And so they were affecting climate and affecting what was going on significantly. A more recent example is the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum. Extrusion of basaltic magma reached a peak 56 million years ago as Norway and Greenland started moving apart. As long as the volcanism is subaerial, it has a big effect on climate. As soon as it becomes all submarine, it can warm the oceans, it can cause acidification of the oceans, but it doesn't have the same effect on climate. You notice the huge change here. Now there are papers in the literature that argue that uh, it must have been lava coming up through peat or coal beds that led to the massive amounts of CO2 that led to this kind of thing. That's beginning to really, a lot of arm waving going on there. Here's a very clear example. We know that Greenland and Norway were rifting apart and we know that related to that rifting was a large amount of basalt that we can see some remnants of in the east and west coast of Greenland. What's interesting, when you look at this over time, you find a very linear relationship between ages of mass extinctions on the y-axis 
and ages of effusive flood basalts on the x-axis. The four times I just mentioned correlate with the end of the Permian, the end of the Triassic, the end of the Cretaceous, the end of the Paleocene. These data were first put together by uh, Cordelow and, and Wren uh, in 2003, and they still stand up today. Almost every time you see a major basaltic lava flow, it's at the end of some geologic epoch or era or period. And if we put these on the geologic time scale, we can see that it really begins to get populated with these kind of events. Here, the uh, Siberian basalts at the end of the Paleozoic, the Deccan basalts the end of the Mesozoic, the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province the end of the Triassic, and so on. I've shown 17 of the largest lips, uh, large igneous provinces. Uh, Richard Ernst has put together about a three inch thick book that documents over 200 of these large igneous provinces. Many of them are throughout the Precambrian. I'm just showing here some of the more important ones. There are only 104 major changes in age since the Cambrian, and including the Cambrian, and there are more than enough large igneous provinces known already to explain most of those changes. I've shown on here some changes in ice ages also, which play a clear role. So the balance of effusive and explosive volcanism seems to explain climate change in detail. And I don't have time here to go into all of the differences, but it clearly relates to plate tectonics. This is the time of snowball Earth about 650 million years ago when Earth was basically covered with glaciers. And you notice that all around the continental upper part of this diagram, there's subduction going on, major subduction. So if we went into a period of very little rifting and major subduction for a long period of time, that's how you could create a snowball Earth. This shows when the Siberian basalts were formed. They were about 255 million years ago. As I said, they were trying to rift apart Siberia. So in many ways, that's what began to get the earth a bit warmer. And we could go on through all of the plate reconstructions and where the basalts are. And what's really impressive is things fit together. Things make sense. So what I've shown you is that the geologic record is pretty clear. Climate's been changing all over the place for a long time. And what we find is that when there's sudden warming, then there tends to be major rift basalt volcanism. When there's major cooling, there seems to be major subduction volcanism. So I want to move on now to the issue of what is heat. And you say, so what? The issue is this. The lower diagram shows uh, the frequencies that are absorbed by greenhouse gases. The one marked water shows all the different frequencies absorbed by water, carbon dioxide, the main frequencies absorbed by carbon dioxide are these, about 14.9 uh, uh, micrometers there. Uh, and the way climate models currently calculate changes in temperature is to integrate across these shaded areas, effectively to determine the area under the curve. And they do these calculations in great detail. We know the spectral lines that are absorbed, and they're, in fact, spectral lines that are not just a big orange like this. We know those in great detail from the laboratory. And the climate models spend a lot of time integrating across the curve, basically assuming that the amount of warming is a question of the amount of frequencies absorbed, which is the amount of energy. They're thinking in terms of amount of energy. And they argue that we don't care what you see in the geologic record. Ozone depletion could not possibly be the cause because when you deplete the ozone layer, this little sliver of red blinking on the right is all the frequencies that get through. To this day, leading climate scientists will argue that to my face, okay? And all the textbooks basically show that. But all the textbooks also show, as any atmospheric chemist knows, that the energy of radiation is equal to the Planck constant times frequency the energy it takes for radiation to split oxygen into two, atomic, two atoms of oxygen is the Planck constant times frequency. And that's the curve plotted here in purple. And what this says is that the energy that reaches Earth when ozone is depleted is 48 times the energy that is being absorbed by carbon dioxide. This energy is 48 times hotter and what that means is a body absorbing this energy can get 48 times hotter than a body absorbing the energy radiated by Earth. 
This energy comes from the sun. It comes from a very hot source. But the important thing is that energy for radiation is equal to a constant times a frequency. And it's happening over a whole lot of frequencies, as we'll describe in a minute. And all of that is what ends up being heat or thermal energy. So energy of the ultraviolet radiation reaching Earth when ozone is depleted is at least 48 times hotter than the energy absorbed by greenhouse gases. Hmm, that's odd. As I just explained, all climatologists on the one hand don't think of energy this way, and all atmospheric chemists do think of energy this way. And in fact, all physicists think of energy this way. Now the interesting thing about radiation is we don't see radiation. We don't see light traveling through this room. We see the effect of light. We see the effects of radiation on matter, but we don't see radiation itself. We cannot see frequency, but we comprehend frequency. You're hearing me with a bunch of low frequencies. You're seeing me with a bunch of high frequencies working your eyeballs, and I'll explain that in a minute. We can see the effects of frequency on matter, but we don't actually see frequency itself. And this is one of the reasons I'm arguing that the way radiation travels is by frequency. It makes a lot more sense. So frequency of what? Well, it's the frequency of oscillation of all the bonds that hold matter together. We observe that the bonds holding matter together are not fixed. They're electrodynamic, and they're based on the fact that when you push two charges together, they try to repel each other. And when you move opposite charges apart, they try to attract each other. And every single bond, and in fact, every uh, vibration within every bond is an atomic oscillator at an atomic scale, where it's the oscillation of those bonds. And what we observe is that when we heat matter, the oscillation increases in frequency and the oscillation increases in amplitude. So there's a relationship between frequency, amplitude, and temperature. Now Max Planck in 1900 came up with an equation that was based on trial and error, simply trying to match the observations of radiation from a body of a given temperature at thermal equilibrium. And from this equation, which works extremely well, you can see that sun includes frequencies all the way from zero up to 5,000 terahertz and more. A terahertz is a million, million cycles per second. We can't perceive that as oscillation, but that is what we perceive as temperature. A light bulb, that is tungsten filament is typically around 3,300 K, radiates all these frequencies shown in yellow. Just to get visible light, just to get a little light in the visible spectrum, you have to radiate all those frequencies in order to get it hot enough to have the, high, the, the light in the visible spectrum. Earth on the left is radiating just that teeny little bit of infrared. Heat is this broad spectrum of frequencies. Heat, we perceive the heat from the sun as all of these frequencies. And when we perceive the heat from a light bulb as all the frequencies in yellow. Now, if we take Planck's law and we put a logarithmic scale, we can see that the vertical black lines here are what's absorbed by carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is only absorbing less than 16% of the frequencies that make up the heat radiated by Earth. Now, if we think of an incandescent light bulb, we know it gets hot enough that we could fry an egg on it. In order to get a little bit of light, we're heating the filament up to 3300K. It's putting out a whole lot of heat. All those frequencies, everything shown in the yellow up there. Um, but that's all heat. The only stuff that's useful for light is the few frequencies in the, in the visible wave band. On the other hand, if you take an LED, you can design an LED to just put out a few frequencies. And most LEDs put out a bunch of frequencies in the visible range. They do not put out frequencies in the infrared or in the ultraviolet. So they're not putting out heat. And this is why LEDs are, use much less energy and why all of us should run home and get rid of those incandescent light bulbs and use LEDs. Our electric bill will go down significantly. 
So greenhouse gases simply do not absorb a broad enough range of frequencies that we perceive as heat to be a significant cause of global warming. Now, I've had endless arguments with many climate scientists about, well, the radiation is absorbed here, and it re-radiates here, and as it goes into a different layer, and so on and so forth. There's just not enough energy in the game. Greenhouse gases do not bring enough skin to the game. They simply do not bring enough energy. There's not enough energy involved. You can make up any model you want. You can write any equation you want. You do not have enough energy to cause warming. So how does heat travel through matter and through air and space? Well, this is something that's been argued about for over 2,000 years. And all the great natural philosophers and great physicists in history have weighed in on this topic. I show some of the better known ones here, but there are, it's, been an, it's been argued for 2,000 years. It was first argued that light is actually particles by Democritus in 410 BC. And he, had a, he made everything, before we even knew what an atom was, he said Earth was made up of a bunch of atoms, uh, light being one of them. It's been argued by many people, including Isaac Newton, that it was particles. It's been measured by even more that it was waves. Because when light interacts with matter in certain waves, you see reflection, refraction, and wave-like kind of things. And so it seems like you could explain them that way. Or the double slit experiment, for those of you that, that know what that is. It's a lot of things we observe that we have been able to successfully explain as if they were waves. And then Einstein and Planck came along and said, well, yeah, it's some of both. It's sometimes better as waves and sometimes better as particles. And what this really says is, use whichever system of equation seems to work best to solve your particular problem. Well, if it's not like A and it's not like B, but it's just sort of like A and sort of like B, then it's not equal to A or to B. That's just basic logic. So up until I came along, the only arguments on the table were waves and particles. I can show, I explain in my book, and I explain in some publications, there's many reasons why heat cannot be waves. Waves are the deformation of medium. There is no medium in space. You can't have waves in space. There's no particles. You can't explain many of the things we see uh, about greenhouse gases with particles. It just doesn't make sense. What I'm saying is heat is frequencies, and the frequencies I'm talking about are not wave frequency. It's the frequencies of oscillation of all the bonds that hold matter together. And that heat is a broad spectrum of frequencies, as we saw in the Planck diagrams. Many, 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 many frequencies. And if you don't have those frequencies, the body doesn't have that temperature, and the body uh, cannot cause something else to warm to that temperature. Now, the interesting thing about the particle equation, which is known as the Planck-Einstein equation, Planck proposed that this ought to be the case in 1900 when he tried to write his law, and he used this in his law. Einstein came along in 1905 and used this to explain photoelectric effect. And what this says is the energy is equal to a constant h, the Planck constant times frequency. And to this day, most physicists will tell you that the energy of a photon is h nu, h times frequency. But frequency is this big, broad spectrum. It goes all the way from radio signals on the left all the way up to gamma rays on the right. 20 orders of magnitude. It's a huge broad spectrum. All of these frequencies exist all of the time, but many of them may have very low amplitudes, so we don't realize they're there. And they all exist together. I mean, in this room around us, all the radio signals that are around, around your cell phone, to radio television stations, all the colors that you're seeing, as I'll explain in a minute, these are all frequencies, they're all here. But they, they exist in this continuum. Well, a, a constant times a continuum equals a continuum. <coughs> that says that energy is a continuum. But if you look this up on Wikipedia tonight, you'll be told that energy is an amount. It's a photon. So what we had to come to realize is, yes, thermal energy in matter is all these frequencies of oscillation. Thermal energy radiated by matter is all these frequencies of oscillation. Thermal radiation absorbed by matter increases these frequencies of oscillation, and that's how we get warming. So again, this was a, hmm, that's odd, when I first came across that and realized, wait a minute, <laughs> this isn't what we learned. This isn't what was in all the physics textbooks. So each frequency, the way it travels, is it causes resonance or sympathetic vibrations. 
An easy way to understand this is take two tuning forks, and if you st they both resonate at, say, uh, A, or whatever uh, note you want, and you hit the one on the left with a hammer, pretty soon the one on the right will start oscillating, and in the end, they both will have the same amplitude of oscillation. So the total oscillation in the first case gets spread out and they share the, the average of the oscillation. So they both end up with the same oscillation. In this case, it's pressure changes in the air. This is how we hear. Pressure changes in the air come into our ears and they go into the cochlea where there are all these different uh, hair, hairs of different lengths. And each hair resonates to a different frequency. And our brain then puts all those pieces together and that's how we hear. That's the way we interact with nature at low frequencies. And here we're talking cycles per second, or maybe tens of uh, 10,000, 20,000 cycles per second. This is the way we transmit a radio signal. Public radio here in, in Tucson transmits from their transmitter a frequency of 89.1 megahertz. You have a receiver that you tune to resonate at that frequency. And that receiver pulls that frequency out of this ocean of frequencies that are out there and increases the amplitude of that within the receiver and you get to hear the radio station. This is the way we see. Sunlight contains a whole broad range of frequencies. When they hit a leaf, for example, it's green, they cause the molecules on the surface of that leaf to oscillate at higher frequency because the amplitude coming in is higher than what was there to begin with and that makes it more intense. Then this resonates with your eyeballs. And it turns out that in the cones in your eyes are cells that respond most strongly to red, green, or blue. And the difference in response for a particular oscillation that's coming in, the brain can see as a different color. And the human brain can distinguish 10 million colors just by putting these together. And this is how your TV monitors work, or your, your uh, computer monitors work. RGB, red, green, blue. They put digitally a signal into the monitor that ends up producing the color. But what I wanted to get here is that resonance, sympathetic oscillations, is the way that amplitude of oscillation propagates both within matter and across the air and space. So there are three key things I said tonight. First of all, volcanoes rule climate change. And I think the geologic evidence for this is really clear. Secondly, where's the heat? Greenhouse gases just don't absorb enough heat to cause global warming. Now, a lot of sci atmospheric scientists don't like me to say that, but I've challenged them to tell me something different. That's what we observe. You saw it tonight. Greenhouse gases absorb a few frequencies, a few thermal energies. I mean, the whole greenhouse gas theory started back in 1859 when Tyndall noted the greenhouse gases absorb some infrared energy. The assumption was, therefore, the gas must get warmer. And that's about the depth of that. I've studied the history of greenhouse gases in extreme detail over a long period of time looking at all the original papers. It was the assumption that because it absorbed this heat, it must get hotter. And the third point is that heat flows by resonance. I went over that pretty quickly. But this is the way you and I interact with the world and with each other, in sound, in sight. Uh, and another way many of you know resonance in the old days of prop jets. You'd hear as the jet went up, there was a, there was a booming, or feedback in a microphone is another kind of resonance. It's all around us. So what are the implications of what I've just said? Well, first of all, we can burn fossil fuel without overheating Earth. Secondly, we must minimize air pollution. We're killing over 3 million people a year with air pollution, primarily in Asia. But even here in North America, we could do some improvements. Third, we need to help the ozone layer recover. There's a whole lecture here I could spend on that, but there are things we could do to help the ozone layer recover. And the sooner we do that, the less the ocean is going to get warmer. Ultraviolet B penetrates the ocean tens of meters. That means that all the ultraviolet B coming in is absorbed by the ocean. It's not reflected back at night. On land, you can reflect some of that heat back at night. But in the oceans, it goes down to great depth. Bottom feeding fish have very high sensitivity to ultraviolet because that's the light they get down at the bottom. We also need to help people understand a fundamental thing about science. 
We're in a really difficult position right now. We've spent decades convincing politicians that greenhouse gases are the cause of global warming and if we don't do something about it real quick, there's going to be major problems for humanity. Now we have to suck it up and say, whoops, we made a mistake. Now in science, mistakes are not uncommon at all. This is one of the ways we move forward. But uh, we've just made, gotten the whole world interested in the concept of greenhouse gases. And this could be the most expensive dollar-wise and most expensive political mistake ever in the history of science. And it's very important that all of us scientists, as we proceed, help people understand that greenhouse warming theory is a mistake, that science is self-correcting. That's one of the benefits of science, that we do learn from our mistakes. Thirdly, that science is never settled. And fourth, that science is still the most logical and valuable way to inform good public policy in our increasingly technological world. Thank you.